So um, we've been working together as semiconductor for over 15 years. Um, and as Susan mentioned, we're interested in the material nature of the physical world around us and how we experience it. And we often turn to the tools and language and processes of science, not only to reveal the, the matter that's beyond the limits of our perception, so the matter that we can't see or we can't hear or perhaps that we can't experience because it happens over very long or short time frames. But we're also interested in looking at how science can mediate our experiences of the natural world. So the impact that it has on our experiences and questioning um, whether we're experiencing science or nature. Um, and a scientist <clears throat> in relation to this once said to us, um, science is a human invention, it's nature that's real. So with this in mind, we're going to um, give a very brief kind of overview of the history of our work. And we're going to start off by looking at a very early piece, which gives a real insight into where we started and the language that we try to develop using digital technologies. Um, were you going to give a bit of the introduction? Yeah. So we... Um, we started out in, in the mid-90s working together um, and we would, we would do performances and live um, digital sound. Um, the, the, the tools at the time were early PC programs, early Adobe software, and we were just playing with stuff, experimenting, and we needed, needed a name for our, for our group because we were doing performances, so we decided to call ourselves Semiconductor, which has kind of stuck until today. And it was the idea that, in a way, the computer is the third element in our, in our band, in our group. It's the two of us and the computer, and the computer is always forcing its own aesthetic onto our work, telling us how things should be, how, how things should be organized, giving, it, giving an aesthetic to our work. So we've always looked to fight the computer and put our human artistic uh, vision back into it. And so, in a way, semiconductors, that idea of um, fighting the conductor, we're par half conducting the work and the computer's half conducting the work. And together, we, we create a kind of unique vision. Um, and so this piece of work that I'm going to show now is called A to Z of Noise. And it's an early work where we experimented with the, the material nature of the computer, um, which obviously comes down to binary, comes down to ones and zeros. And it, in the computer, the sound and image are meaningless. So an image can be turned into sound, and the sound can be turned into image. And also you have concepts like um, noise reduction, which things can, processes and um, effects you can use to work with that, that translate from, from it, image and sound. So in this work, we took the idea of noise reduction on pure black video and noise reduction on one second of black, of, of pure audio noise. And we repeated that 60 times. And so in the end, the computer actually created something out of pure noise and something out of pure black video. And this is um, the results. So this is a very sort of raw early piece of work and what I wanted to sort of illustrate 
is the idea that you are experiencing the computer's aesthetic and you're, you're, you're seeing and feeling the way that it works. It's, 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 it's a kind of engine. It's, computers are designed to organize and manage and clean things up. and We like making things messy. So we're trying to put an organic human nature back into it. And so this material, material nature of the computer is, is a kind of experience that we've developed and translated into um, over the years. And we'll now move on to a different work. Yeah, so the next work we're going to look at kind of jumps 10 years. <laughs> um, and it's a piece called 20 Hertz. And we put them side by side because we think it shows how we've developed our own language as artists using these very basic um, zeros and ones and how we've gone on to develop our own language and also the kind of methods and processes and concepts behind work. And in this period of 10 years, we became much more interested in science and nature and landscape. And we were working a lot with uh, scientific data and the processes and language of science. Um, and in, I think the first time we worked with scientific data was about 2000 and we worked with seismic data and then took that seismic data and used it to reanimate the landscape that it had been collected in. And so over that period of 10 years, we started to kind of fine tune our own processes and digital techniques for working with scientific data. Um, and in this piece, you will see um, it's um, CG animation. And all, all the image you see is being created and controlled by the sound. And the sound is um, scientific data which has been collected across a large network of magnetometers in the north of America. So it's this vast, covers this vast area of North America and it's collecting data from the Earth's upper atmosphere in an area called the magnetosphere. And it's collecting the data at a frequency of 20 hertz, which is this very particular frequency that the scientists are interested in looking at. And we worked with the scientists to turn this data into something audible. So everything you hear is the data turned into sound. And we have then used that to animate and visualize the data. And I'll talk more about the concepts behind doing that afterwards.
So we quite often work in this way, taking data and creating visual uh, three-dimensional generative animations from it. And we're interested in taking the data as a representation of nature and then exploring how we can physically relate to that. So we're creating experiences through doing that. And we're also interested in working with simple scientific devices to suggest scientific analysis. So in this instance, we worked with the shallow depth of field and the black and white nature of electron microscopy. So using those to emphasize that there's a human observing the process. So we're not just interested in creating phenomena or recreating phenomena, but we're interested in looking at the kind of noise that happens between man and nature when experiencing it through science. And science tends to introduce noise, it introduces artifacts, and it has its very own signature, which are these things which I'm talking about, which are the shallow depth of field. And they're always present, and they remind us that man is simply observing the world around him. And we often use these as devices in our work, which you'll see in some of the other pieces. Um, I'll just say something about the sound that you were hearing there, because the, the scientists kind of speculate about the types of things you're hearing in that sound. Um, and you were hearing some very low rumbles, and they think that, that is the solar wind coming in and hitting the Earth's magnetosphere and creating these large kind of ripples. And then that's how the data comes out. As you see, the data translated into image ends up creating these large waveforms. And then there's lots of other different sounds going on. There's some very kind of high-pitched frequencies, which they think are lots of electrons buzzing around and bumping into each other and things. I mean, I think a lot of this is speculation. I don't think um, that it's very scientific in how they're thinking about it. Um, look, are you going to talk about... We're going to... Okay. I'll we'll just say a little bit more about... Um, mm. Well, we, we, we don't have any training in science or... Um, any, you know, we haven't studied it. We, we, we actually taught ourselves how to use computers and... Um, when, when we studied at college in the late 90s, you'd, you'd print something on, the, on the, 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 um, the art school network and it would crash the whole network on the whole college. You know, that's how basic they were. Um, so all of these things are just interests we've had that we've, we've learned and developed over the years. And one of the ways we've, we've gone about this is um, throwing ourselves in the deep end. We've, we've done many residencies where we've um, we started off just drawing open submission and we would just apply and fingers crossed we would get it and we, we've ended up getting amazing residencies opportunities to go and work with NASA scientists for example and we would go into those situations very naively but also um, we would do our homework and so we would obviously have to you know interact engage with the scientists and, uh, and we're just you know some some young brats that you know aren't even they don't even really think we have anything in common with and we would have to kind of get them to open up to us and talk about their work. And we would we'd always do our homework and find out you know, as much as we could about that scientist and ask them questions that would open them up. And the scientists love talking about their work, but they're always used to um, people coming along, journalists asking the obvious questions. You know? And so as an artist, we have a unique perspective and interest. We're interested in different things than they normally ask. And scientists love talking about their work. So. Um, if you just you get in there and ask them the right question, you suddenly find this the Pandora box of wonderful things to, to um, be inspired by. And so what, often we would actually go into these, these residencies and in a way steal. <laughs> we, would, we would take their, their work and their data um, you know, with, with permission most of the time. <laughs> and, um, but, but normally when artists and scientists work together, they're, they're usually actually collaborating and you know, there's, there's usually some kind of an illusion that they're both actually putting some kind of equal um, you know, effort into the product. But really, um, we, we're interested in taking their data and, uh, and creating a way of experiencing phenomena that happens um, that you, you normally normally invisible to us. And so we're interested in the way that Science is something that is done you know, by smart people who understand very, very fine, detailed technical things. And that has to then be translated into a form for us to understand, to take on. Um, and so there's a, there's a period of translation between you know, a kind of model of nature that the scientists are creating 
and then translating it into a language and a visual or, or story that then can be understood by us. And in a way, we're taking, we're going to that source and, and creating our own stories, as it were, about what's, what's happening. And um, we've done many opportunities, we've had many residencies where we've, we've met many different types of people. Um, but, but right now we're going to show a bit of um, a, a short film called Black Rain, which is, we were, we were approached by a scientist working on a, a project called Stereo. And he said, I've got these amazing, this amazing data looking at the solar wind. Um, would you like to work with it? And it's, it doesn't happen very often that someone comes to us and says, you know, here's my data. Would you like to work with it? Normally, we have to actually go and get it. But this, this work ended up um, it being quite successful in that the BBC saw it on, um, on our website. And they went to the scientists and said, we, we like that, that, that film, that data. We want to use it in our news um, TV series by Brian Cox, Wonders of the Solar System. And, um, and they, they went to the scientists and said, can we have that? And the scientists said, no, that semiconductor's work. They've decided how it looks. Because it's not the data. The data doesn't come back looking really nice. The data comes back looking really hideous. You actually have to make quite a lot of aesthetic choices to make scientific data into something that's really interesting to look at and work with. And so in this film, we've created actual, a whole aesthetic um, playground. And so that we've chosen to leave in all the anomalies and all the, the grain and dirt and keep the rawness in the data in a way, try and keep it as true as possible, but also leave in all the extra stuff, stuff that tells you the story of how it was collected, like the way the satellite is moving in space, the, the, where the flares and blowouts of all the extra, excess data and light is all creating artifacts. And all of that stuff is, is, would normally be removed by the scientists, cleaned up. You know, they create science products which have all this stuff removed. And we're not interested in them. We want it all in there. We want to create an experience of what's actually happening. So this film, Black Rain, it's not a three-minute film.
So after um, that was parts of that were included in Brian Cox's one of the solar system, we ended up getting credited above NASA, which was quite an achievement. Um, so we make we make several versions of our work. We think about different contexts to to make the, the work exist. So um, this this film we 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 have a single screen version that um, uh, a portrait version of unedited material that exists as an installation. And this is it at the Royal Academy where you, you see a stream of the solar wind raining down. Um, and so we're always thinking about making our work adaptable for different types of scenarios. So we don't have one version that's like, this is our artwork and, and um, that's the way it needs to be. We're always kind of thinking of our work just in different contexts. So our, our work will be not just shown in, in art gallery situations like this, it'll be shown at film festivals and um, online, this, you know, most of the work to show today is available on our website because it's really good to watch on as, as a single screen, but we also have expanded multi-screen versions and we're always playing with it. And I'll just mention a little bit about the sound again. It's, it's the sound in that film was made by the image, so we used the luminescence and brightness of the image to generate the soundtrack. So when it got brighter, different parts of the soundtrack would be created and um, played louder. And so in a way, it creates another, another type of way of experiencing the work. You experience the visual imagery through sound, and it makes it more um, like a, um, a synesthetic experience. Um, okay, I think I've said a lot about that. Okay, so in 2005, we, um, we did our NASA Space Sciences Fellowship, and we spent six months in the Space Sciences Lab in Berkeley in California, and it was really open. I think at the time, the people who had organized it said, it doesn't matter if you don't make anything, you know, you can just, it's just about having the experience. And we were quite terrified going into it, thinking, oh, what if we go to a Space Sciences Lab and we don't have any ideas? You know, it's like the worst fear as an artist, you think you're never gonna have any ideas again. And um, we were in the Space Sciences Lab every day, um, for the six months, so we really immersed ourselves in the science, and we purposefully went there, as Joe mentioned, we purposefully go to these environments quite naive about the science, because we're not there to learn about the science. In our, in our minds, we're there to almost observe the scientists and see how they carry out their science, so we're interested in the language they're using, the science products, so the drawings they make, the, the sounds they make, um, the way they talk about it to each other, the way they talk about it to members of the public. Um, so all the different products and the processes and the technology they use. So we knew those were the things we were interested in when we went there. And we spent a lot of time talking to the scientists about what they were doing. And we kind of fell in with this group of scientists who were studying magnetic fields. And so they're looking at magnetic fields on the sun, on Mars, um, they're looking at them on Earth and interplanetary magnetic fields that wave off out into space. So they're these massive things, they're huge things, but they're things that they can also measure. So they can send a satellite up orbiting Mars and they can measure the magnetic fields and try to get some understanding of, of what they are. So the whole way that they would be describing magnetic fields to us really interested us because we it's something we can't see or we can't experience, yet they were throwing all these different ways trying to interpret what they were. And so we had an idea for this piece of work called Magnetic Movie, where we would use all the different types of language that they were throwing at us and bring it all together, bring the magnetic fields down onto a human scale, something we could experience, and then see what happens. It's kind of our own experiment. So I'll show you the movie first and I'll talk a bit about it afterwards. It's just five minutes. Magnetic fields are, by their nature, invisible. There are some things that nature does to make them more visible. Uh, for example, in the corona, the magnetic fields control the atmosphere to the extent that you can see loops. We consider that those loops are, in fact, pictures of the magnetic field system.
the description that scientists often use is hair involved. And some of the hair is ingrown <laughs> so that the loop is attached to the sun at both ends. But some of the hair goes waving out, and when stuff gets on that open field line, it can spin out and become a solar wind. How hairy it is depends on where we are in the solar cycle. As the active regions begin to emerge from the photosphere, it gets very messy. And so it gets hairier and hairier and messier and messier as the solar cycle progresses. And there's no active region around. The magnetic field can be generated just by the turbulent motion itself. And what you see is that all the magnetic field tends to be crushed and centralized in these intergranular lanes in between the bubbles. So if you're looking at the surface, you see these little dancing dots. And they'll appear, they'll emerge, and then they'll move around, and they'll hit each other and cancel or be smooth. Things happen on many different time scales. Photons take 200,000 years to run and walk away from the core all the way out to where we see them at the photosphere jet. Millions of a second of reconnection or something that completely changes the topology of the phenomenon. Just say something quickly about how we fund making our work because this piece, um, as you can see there, it was an Animate, project, Animate Projects Commission um, and they existed at the time um, to fund um, artists' animation works that would then be shown on Channel 4. And when we were at the residency, we came up with this idea and we thought at the time it might be a piece of work that was suitable for that. But we knew that it was going to be a very time-consuming piece of work to make, just because of the nature of doing computer-generated animation. Um, and so we knew we would have to leave there and then go back to maybe film it and make some of it and find substantial funding to make it. So it was a project that we did, weren't sure whether we would make or not. But quite often, sometimes we'll get apply for Arts Council funding to make our own work. Sometimes we have um, commissioners who are putting together art exhibitions who might approach us. 
Um, there can be international projects. Sometimes we'll make a body of work off the back of a fellowship or residency, or there'll be extra funding that comes from that. So there's lots of different ways that we kind of get to make our work um, and financially support it. Um, but I'll just say about this piece. So the magnetic movies actually make the photographic stills, which we then divided up to create a pretend three-dimensional space and insert the magnetic fields into. And the, the colourful lines that you're seeing are actually taken directly from how scientists ordinarily represent magnetic fields. So they'll have some data that says this is a magnetic field and this is where it's heading, is maybe, maybe heading up or maybe heading down, and they use different colours to suggest movement in it. And so we, we liked that as a way of representing magnetic fields. Whereas, in fact, that representation, they're kind of being untrue to the science themselves because how they represent magnetic field lines as a line, fields are just fields, as it suggests. So it's like a plane of stuff covering space. But there's no better way for them to represent visually magnetic fields other than lines. So they actually have misrepresentation all the way through. They talk about magnetic fields. Um, something interesting that happened with this piece of work was it was posted um, on YouTube and then it kind of went viral with loads of people arguing about it, whether it was real or not. Some people said it needed a sign at the front saying this is art, not science. You know, and it was never our intention to try and trick people. When we first made the piece of work, we didn't imagine for one moment that people would think it was kind of real in some way. Um, but all these arguments ensued and even some scientists from other NASA labs who knew the scientists that we'd worked with got in contact with them to say, wow, I didn't realize you've been doing those experiments. Things that kind of really baffled us. Um, um, and people quite often ask us about how the scientists felt about the work. And it was quite a long time that we actually then went back to the lab. And in that period of time, Magnetic Movie had been shown quite a lot in the US and it had been shown at some big museums and things like that. So they'd had quite a lot of people coming up to them saying, oh, I, I saw you in, a, in Magnetic Movie in, you know, in Herschel or something like that. And so the scientists were feeling quite good about themselves because they'd um, been in this movie. And when we went back to the lab, we had an amazing experience, didn't we? Because they were, they were very welcoming and they wanted to work with us again. So we kind of had this really good relationship. And I think we probably will go back and do some work, kind of 10 years later, go back and, mm. and do some more work. Um, should we go on to... Okay, so I can talk over this one. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a piece of work called Heliocentric. Heliocentric is the idea that the sun is at the centre of our solar system. Now, we all take for granted the idea, um, this idea, that, um, but it's something we've been told. Uh, has anyone here, um, has anyone here ever actually done a test to see that, that we are going around the sun <laughs> and that it's the Earth rotating? You know, it's, it's something that we're told by science and that we believe because it makes sense but we don't actually know it's true because none of us have actually done the tests ourselves <laughs> and so what, with this piece of work we wanted to actually create the experience of heliocentric and so what we've done is time-lapse animations using uh, astronomical tracking equipment that keep the camera pointing at the sun for, a, for an entire day and this is just an excerpt of, of the film and so what happens is the sun stays still and the earth rotates by um, and, it, and strange anomalies happen but what you're actually watching is a day you're actually seeing what it's ex a, a day really feels like and so this idea of um, scientific fact is something that we believe we know it's fact but, but none of us have actually ever tested it <laughs> we just believe it and so in a way we've created our own internal fictionalization of, of a fact just to actually make it make sense, to believe in it. And it's, it's this idea you know, that science is something that's absolute truth, but it's still something that you have to create a fiction of in your head to believe. <laughs> um, and this piece of work, again, is, is something we always play with, the idea that you create an experience um, of something that will allow you to actually make more sense of it. And so now you can experience what it actually feels like for the Earth to rotate and the sun to stay still. Yeah, we, we did about, in the final work, there's about six time lapses. 
and um, sometimes we show it as a multi-screen piece of work. The pans are about five to ten minutes long when, when played in full length. And um, we, it was, we would have to actually work out um, in advance exactly where the sun was going to rise before you could see it and, and have the equipment all set up, which was quite a mathematical, complicated thing to do. And we would have to find the location, scout it in advance, and be there before dawn and stay in exactly that spot all day until, until after it's sun has set. Um, in, in the greenhouse, it was a very nice environment, but sometimes we were on top of a hill and it was, at, um, you know, it was we were quite exposed. And it was, it was very strange to actually experience an entire day. You think you know what it means a, d a day, but until you sit in one spot and watch it <laughs> from dawn to dusk, it's um, something else. We worked with a musician for this piece and um, again we used the brightness, the luminescence of the image to control the soundtrack and so you kind of feel the sun's light move across the sky. So the sun becomes a stylus, um, creating the soundtrack as it stays still and the earth moves by. thought that the, um, the sun would actually burn out the, um, the CCD in the camera because we'd be looking at it all day long. But it turned out to be fine on, on digital SLRs because we, obviously an SLR has an open and shut um, that would actually stop it from burning out. And what would happen is that each day would be about 15,000 photographs and the, the lifespan of a SLR was about 100,000 photographs. So after a few, a few days usage, the actual shutter mechanisms would fail and um, we have to get new cameras. <laughs> yeah, so when that's installed, you have the whole day as one pan that you watch for the last 10 or 15 minutes. That's just a kind of edited medley. Um, we've got one more work to talk about. We've got enough time for just two, three. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Great. <laughs> Um, so we come from a very hands-on background when we did our degrees, we were very hands-on, we were both working sculpturally and making installation works, and it was always something we wanted to return to. Even though in all of our moving image works that we make, we feel that they're very sculptural. There's something like 20 hertz, it's quite easy to see, that we're working with sound and we're kind of creating these time-based sculptures. And we've always considered all of those works to be very sculptural and to have all of those experiences that have been very hands-on coming into the work. Um, and this is a sculpture, a real kind of sculpture, <laughs> that we made um, last year that was launched last October. And Jerwood Open Forest um, is a new commission that they started last year. So it's a collaboration between the Jerwood Foundation and the Forestry Commission looking not just for sculptures but looking for art to place in the forest and that can be doing performances in the forest. Um, the other person who got commissioned was Chris Watson and he had a sound piece in a forest up in Northumberland. Um, and we were very interested about looking for science um, that was happening in the forest. We, ha we gave a very open proposal that we wanted to find some scientists working with a forest in the UK somewhere, the Forestry Commission. And they found us this amazing 
forest, which is an experimental forest. So it's the Forestry Commission's experimental forest. It's a very kind of romantic idea that this 100-year-old oak forest, predominantly oak, um, which has only ever existed for scientists to experiment on. And in the middle of the, the forest is this tower, um, which is called a flux tower. It's just a very wobbly scaffolding tower. And on top of that, there's some instruments above the tree canopy. And this is one of the, um, actually, this isn't one of the instruments. This is a camera looking down, but lots of the instruments are placed at the top. And they're collecting different types of data. So they're looking for carbon dioxide uptake and release. They're looking at temperature, um, at water vapor, and then it can also collect um, three-dimensional wind information. So we were interested in taking this data and trying to make it tangible trying to turn it into something that we could physically relate to and then seeing what happens, seeing how we respond to it and what it becomes. So we worked with, we took this data, which took a very long time because it was this incredibly old um, format, DOS format, which um, we had to kind of create some software programs just to get hold of the data. Um, and then we were thinking about ways that we would work with that data. We'd been looking at how scientists work with that data and how they plot the information. And one of the ways they do it is working with polar plots. So it's a graph, and say the blue line maybe represents carbon dioxide, and they can use it to show a year's worth of data. And then they can overlay different types of data. And so we started this as the basis for creating the physical structure of the sculpture, and then worked with the different um, data layers. <clears throat> and so we turned the data into um, a tangible form using um, a 3D program. So we, we created the whole sculpture in a um, digital three-dimensional program. And then we played with it and we worked with it according to the, um, the polar plots. And you start to see how all the data interacts. It starts forming quite complex waveform structures and patterns. And we wanted to work with the data in this very raw way, so that when you see the sculpture, you're not, you don't need to know exactly what it is you're looking at. But we're interested in how, as humans, we learn about our environments through looking for patterns. And we've learned what those patterns are, and a lot of the time we don't realise that we're, or most of the time we don't realise that we're actually doing that. And also it's the way that scientists are working, that they're looking for patterns in the data. So we wanted something to be born from the forest, but also to suggest that there was something digital and there were some other types of processes going on. So this has been um, in Alice Holt Forest um, near Farnham since October, and it got snowed on yesterday for the first time. And our scientist um, runs past it daily, and um, so he sent some photographs of it covered in snow. Um, and it, it sits about a kilometre away from where the data was collected. So we like to think that you know, it is representing the data that has gone into making the forest around it. So the, the same forces that um, have shaped the forest, you know, mm. the, the, the water and the wind, are actually being completely changed through the, you know, through the science and the computer but then are shaping this sculpture. So they're the same forces shaping the trees and the, and the sculpture. Mm. And um, it's a year's worth of data, which is why it's a sphere. Mm. And um, it's two meters high. And uh, it has these, these cracks around it, these hexagons, so that it can expand its design so that when it gets wet in the winter, it will grow um, as the wood expands. And if it didn't have those, it would pop. And so we had to actually build um, design features in it to to make an you know, outdoor wooden sculpture that wouldn't burst. Mm. Um, yeah, I'll just say, if anybody wants um, to find out anything more about our work, on our website we've just put on a few recent essays that people have done on our work. And one of them is by Lily Husbands that was in the uh, Moving Image Review and Journal last year, and it's a really great essay, kind of gives really good kind of fundamentals of our work and we've made them all downloadable so you can download we've them. We've also got off. a few um, um, leaflets to go with this sculpture here. So yeah, if anybody wants any Cosmos, Cosmos yeah. leaflets. It's mm -hmm. They want to go and visit it. It's there permanently. Hopefully it'll last 10, 20 years.
<laughs> well, for a wooden sculpture, that it's, it's not bad. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Well, um, they have, they have a. Normally, wind is just measured in terms of north, south, east, west. But, but the scientists are very interested in the wind going up and down because the trees breathe and they create their own vortices. And this, this is really the, where the carbon cycle really exists. And so that, that there's moisture and, um, and stuff moving up and down within the forest. And so that up and down is, is, the, is the, you know, the, the third direction that you don't, we don't normally think about as humans. Mm. <laughs> but they collect it actually audibly, don't they? They yeah. collect it through a sonic, it's called a sonic anemometer. And so it's just a sonic anemometer. Yeah. And so it picks up the wind moving through frequencies in the air. And so we've so taken... So don't ask me too much so about it. Each, <laughs> each one of these, these axes is, is just a wiggle, a mm. line. Um, and we've taken each one of those, those lines and, and mapped it onto, yeah. the, onto the sphere. Mm. So, the so all of the data exists as um, strings of numbers. So if you think of that in terms of then turning that into a line, you could say that the line, a flat line, say, starts at zero, and then you could have one, two, three, and then you would go, la, 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 and then so as soon as you start tracking out those, those numbers from the data as a line, you start to get a waveform like this. Mm. Mm. Well, the lump is really, it's kind of, no, the lump has become a really a surface for then the data. It's, it's hollow inside. Oh. I know. It's the only way, it's the only way it can be made. It, so, yes, yeah, so it was CNC. So so normally you would 3D mill or something like this, yeah. so you'd have a, a, a multiple, a four axis five, five thing, axis, which I don't even yeah. understand. We, we had to work this out ourselves because it was a budget. We had to figure out a way of doing it with a two-dimensional one that just goes up and down. So, and then yeah. there's, a, there's a plate that moves around like this, and then something just goes up and down. And that's a, a, a two-axis. So I each think. of those kind of polygons that you yeah. can see there, that's all made up of triangular parts. So they lie flat on a bed, and they can be cut out. So they all have to be cut out individually and then matched up perfectly. It was just so stressful matched up to meet perfectly, even though we didn't personally make it. It was a very stressful process. Um, so then, yeah, the data was then kind of essentially carved by a digital machine. Normally we do everything ourselves in our work. Yeah. <laughs> and it, We're not, we're not really worried about whether there's any authenticity in it. Um, we're interested in the mediated relationship between how we understand science. And so you, everything we try and understand, we have to actually build a picture in our head, a model in our head. And of course, that's an illusion. And the science, science isn't reality. Science is a model of reality. So science is, is um, scientists create a picture, a map of how they un try to understand something. And they do it as best they can as a representation of the nature of reality. So you've got one virtual version of the real thing, and then we have to create a picture in our minds of that virtual thing. <laughs> and so it's all these mediated spaces between us and actually what's really going on. And the experience is something we're interested in, in how we actually um, consume um, this information. And so, so nowadays, we're, we're, we're constantly being... Um, thrown in the deep end of, of amazing things scientists are discovering, but we, d we take it for granted. We, we don't question scientific documentaries when they, they have all these fantastic illustrations on the screen. We just believe it all, and, and it, it's all a mediated space that we're, um, 
that being you know translations of what's actually going on and so our work is actually playing in, in that playground mm. yeah well, I mean we do refer to our work a lot as science fiction or fictional um, science or fictional science <laughs> and, pe and people similarly will, will use our work to try and illustrate science maybe in um, you know kind of uh, gallery education they think oh this is good you know we'll put it in there and it's we're teaching people about magnetic fields, but they're not. <laughs> but we're at fine best about. We're at fine best inspire them. Yeah, we're fine about people curating our work like that. Um, you know, we wouldn't say no to that, but that isn't the intention. So behind on our the work. way up here, I was talking to Ruth about, you know, so an artist like Otelis Group. They they will take um, 